Okay, question and answer time from the last market outlook. Uh, two questions here. If I sell a cash secured call option, cash secured call, how would you do that? If you sell a call at a strike of 50 and the stock goes to 60, <clears throat> you'd need $6,000. If the next day it goes to 61, you'd need 61. Would you keep, do you mean that you keep increasing your cash each day? Exercise before expiration, how does the overall transaction work? Uh, IBKR um, gives you a short position. They'll deliver, they'll look at your account, they'll see that you don't have shares, they'll borrow the shares from someone else and deliver them and you will have a short position in your account. So the next day you'll have negative 100 uh, whatever shares. You will have a short position. Does IBKR buy the shares at market price on my behalf? and transfer the shares to the option holder? No, they just arrange a, a borrow. Do I get a warning? Usually you do. Usually you, you'll, as, as expiration comes near, um, if there is a possibility of assignment, uh, you may get a warning. But the, <clears throat> the long side has till 8 p.m. that night uh, to, um, to call the shares away. So usually it usually happens after the market is closed. Sometime in the middle of the night, it just happens. <clears throat> it's no big deal. You have a short position. The next morning, just buy to cover your short. On a paper portfolio, sometimes the point eight delta put options I've sold in hopes of getting the shares assigned were not assigned. Despite the stock price reaching the strike price, stock price reaching the strike price, Okay, well, it wouldn't be assigned if it reaches the strike price and even a bit lower below the strike price plus option price. Even a bit below the strike price plus option price. I'm not following what that means, which would make the option holder realize a profit. Which option holder? You're holding it and the other side is holding it. What would be the reason? I, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's a riddle. I can't, I can't figure out where you're going with this. Or is it something that happens that, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I, I can't follow. If you're selling a 0.8 delta, stock is like this, a 0.8 delta on a put is much higher. And you're saying the stock price rises to the, to the price. It's saying even the stock price reaching the strike price, why would it be assigned? Uh, even a bit lower below the strike price, so let's say it gets to here, plus option price. Plus option price? I don't know. I, I, it's a riddle. I can't figure it out. No idea. Uh, question about PEG. If we use forward PE, isn't the forward growth already baked into the forward earnings? Why divide by another growth rate? Um, yeah, I've answered that one in the, uh, in the live feed. Um, you're dividing uh, the PE by it and the PE is based on the price so you have some forward earnings forecast and yes the growth of earnings is in that but you're not dividing the earnings growth by the growth you're dividing the price uh, whatever the price multiple is so if earnings are two bucks and the price is 20 you have a peg of 10 right that's that's just that's just a number uh, so if you divide that by the growth rate you get you get you know your peg ratio but you're not you're not dividing it twice the PE uh, is a multiple of, of earnings what's with the Swiss National Bank they already started cutting rates um, they're just two statements I don't see question marks I imagine there's a what's with the Swiss National Bank they already started cutting rates um, yeah I'm not sure what that what, what you're getting at here like um, are you asking if they've already started cutting rates yes they have so uh, I'm not sure what what you're trying to ask there does the reduction in the feds reverse repo well it's not a reduction in the feds reverse repo it's a reduction in the uptake uh, the Fed is not reducing the reverse repo balance 
market participants are just not using it as much. Does it affect uh, impact repo rates in the private market? Not really, no. No. I've been looking at the applied option topic, interest rate futures. I'm a bit confused about what happens to our margin over time and what happens at the end of the contract if our prediction turns out to be wrong. Uh, interest rate futures. Nothing happens to your margin over time. Uh, the contract is marked to market, which means that any losses day to day, you pay them every single day. So you don't have so the margin uh, is a brand new margin every single day. So the margin on the contract, let's say, is two thousand uh, dollars, and you enter a contract, and the next day you have a loss. Uh, money leaves your account and pays the other side, and it's as if you have a brand new contract that, that day with a margin of 2000 So the margin stays constant, but your losses are paid out of your account every single day. Uh, do we simply settle the difference at the end of the month? No, it's done every day. Uh, it's been long since IPO. This is Palantir. I'm of the mindset. 23 was the year of AI build-out, hence low growth. The uh, company has a long sales cycle than most SA uh, software services, not currently pay per consumption. I believe their backlog is like one and a half years of sales right now. 23 revenue hardly reflects any AI buzz. It's delayed growth from prior customer acquisition. The commercial customer count really started to fly second half. I don't think we'll see that success come through top line for another three or four quarters. Um, still doesn't change their forecast for 2024 growth, which is actually they said it's 19 to 20 percent growth. You know, I get that it takes time to roll these out, but 19 to 20 percent growth. If they have a backlog uh, that's increasing, that tells me they have pricing power that they can they can certainly increase their pricing. I like a core holding of shares with this and adjusting my delta with covered calls put since it jumps between my fair value estimates overvalued pretty often. Question about valuation. How would you value a commodity producer? Uh, I think I know where you're going here. Fixed cost to produce underlying commodity has volatility. Yeah, that is uh, is difficult. So if you look at a company, any mining company, uh, you can pretty much see a, a tight range or a range in which its operating costs would be would be pretty much the same uh, and then its net income would be a function of the sales price of whatever it is that it's that it's selling which means you'd have to have some forecast of copper prices or gold prices silver prices for the next <clears throat> five years even which hardly seems like uh, an experiment to get involved with you could always use the uh, the futures curve uh, but uh, the further out you go uh, like if you look at the futures curve uh, in contango for example uh, and assume that your producer sells everything at those particular futures prices you can come up with a fully hedged revenue forecast and a fully but <clears throat> you're still gonna have to forecast input costs all that kind of stuff um, if you're forecasting, yeah, it's there are assumptions that you're making. You know, you can do it that way, although it's it's rather difficult to do. Uh, what you can do is you can take a um, price of copper. Uh, let's say it's uh, four dollars, and you can assume a flat four dollar price of copper, uh, and um, which is a real forecast right so uh, you can then increase the output by whatever uh, and then you can forecast uh, all of your costs and expenses uh, and then your adjustment to your fair value uh, would be based on whether copper prices go above four dollars or go below four dollars so on a day where you see copper going below four let's say you get to a fair value of uh, 50 bucks for something and it's trading at 51.50 and copper's at four and you see copper dropping, you can expect, uh, well, maybe not expect, but you would then, you know, adjust your price down. You'd have one sell and then you'd have your forecast and then uh, if copper ends that day at 395, you'd put 395 in and you'd look at what your 
present value would be. Uh, that's done quite a bit. So if you look at, uh, <clears throat> you know, some of the price adjustments on companies like uh, well, almost any mining company, sometimes on a weekly basis, you'll get price adjustments. You know, uh, such and such firm adjusted their price on BHP from 62.10 to 63.20. And you think, well, like such small little changes. <clears throat> and that, that all comes from just changing in the price. So you can forecast a flat price. Uh, and then on a daily basis, you can just change that assumption and have a look at what the price is in the market based on what price you've calculated. Uh, obviously, uh, if prices on the commodity are going up, your share price would be going up. Uh, you, that, that you'd be moving your price target up. And if you follow some of the mining companies, you'll find that they usually follow their commodity uh, um, you know, in that particular fashion, if the price of the commodity is going up, their price is going up. If the commodity is down one day, you'll see their price is down that day as well. <clears throat> uh, how relevant is level one 2022 versus 2024 on a percentage scale? I don't know. Uh, I haven't done level one for two years now. Uh, I'm pretty much exclusive at level three. Uh, I haven't I haven't done anything in level one. I don't even know what it looks like this year. I don't even look at it because, well, I don't do any work there, so <laughs> I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, quick question on maintaining an appropriate safe level of current available funds to current excess liquidity on my IB account. Oftentimes I get that dreaded message from IB with a highlighted area in yellow. Yeah, that's not a pleasant one to get, is it? Uh, telling me that I have to deposit extra funds. Well, when it's in yellow, you don't have to deposit ex extra funds. When it's in yellow, it's giving you it's giving you the warning that gives you time to take action. Should I try to maintain my current excess liquidity levels well above my value at risk, expecting shortfall levels? Mm. Mm. I trade both options and stocks, mostly options. There's another way to keep out of trouble simply check that's what I do I mean I just I keep my eye on it I don't want to get too close to it like I don't want to get you know 12 percent because if you get a down day you know 50 points down 60 points down on S&P and you sold some puts you could easily breach that easily and now you're being knocked out uh, having an allocation of cash especially at 5.5 percent makes sense because that cash acts as uh, your margin because you can easily convert one of those to cash without any price risk at all. A three-month T-bill yielding 5.5% with no price risk. That's a great place uh, to leave cash because you're getting paid 5.5% just, just on your margin, just, just on the safety reserve that you have. I mean, that's a good place to be. And then when you need cash, you can sell them at you know a $1,000 face value at a time. Because you can always get back in tomorrow at the same 5.5%. There is no price risk. So you can move in and out, in and out. It's a nice place to keep money. Uh, current excess liquidity. Well, I mean, that doesn't tell me anything. 12,553. Uh, what if you have, you know, 60 million uh, and your current excess liquidity is 12? That's one, you know, one or two pips, one or two uh, pennies away on an option could put you under. I mean, that doesn't tell me very much. Yeah. Um, the best way to avoid that is just to stay as far away from the 10% line as you can. Um, that's, you know, that's part of managing the liquidity is, is, you know, when that little yellow light comes on, it's basically saying you're not doing a very good job at managing your liquidity or you're too much on one side of the trade. You're either all puts or all calls, you know, that you're not finding a balance between them. Love the arb trade on uh, MicroStrategy. Maybe even more appealing to me is the front man is extremely shady. Pull up his SEC rap sheet. One thing though, if you're looking at the carry cost to short, would also be we're looking at the indirect fees on the long side too. Yeah, uh, combined it's two percent per year. Well, two percent per year is not much, but two percent annualized to, to carry that position. You don't have to use GBTC. Uh, it has been experiencing uh, outflows. You can use uh, other other ETFs uh, with that. 
looming shortage of helium. Have you looked into helium at all? Not really. I haven't looked into that at all. Uh, MicroStrategy you have to keep rebalancing your deltas. No, you don't because it is you're you're basically long and short the same thing. Bitcoin. You're you're basically long and short the same thing with a, a small little software company on the side. Mention one of the reasons U.S. economy is insensitive to interest rates is because of the sophisticated financial instruments that allow for interest rate hedging. My understanding is that interest rate hedging instruments don't eliminate interest rate, they, they simply transfer it to another part. Have I not answered this question like half a dozen times? I have. Uh, I think the person asking this is just not listening uh, to, uh, to this video to get the answer. So I'll answer it one more time and I will be done. Uh, you have a producer, let's say, uh, that is producing something. Uh, let's say it's copper. There's a copper miner, and then you have a, a user uh, which is using something, and let's say it's copper. Well, they are natural parties to be on the opposite side of the same contract. And you might say, why would anyone be long? Well, why would anyone be short? Same thing. You know, they're going to be a seller. They're going to be a buyer. So it's the same with interest rates. <clears throat> For everyone that has an asset, uh, somebody else has a liability. And they're concerned about the opposite things. So they help each other out. Uh, so, yeah, there is a, uh, a cost. Uh, you know, when you hedge, you're going to get money that protects you. Somebody else has to pay that money. But that other person is getting some income from a market rate that was above what they, what they wanted anyways. They wanted to lock in a certain rate. <clears throat> so because of um, hedging, because one person's asset... Uh, is more than a financial asset is, is obviously somebody else's financial liability. Uh, if they're on different sides of the same contract, they're both winning. <clears throat> they both have a locked in rate. They're both insensitive to changes in rates. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> one of the major economies, central banks taking cues from the U.S. Fed to follow suit in cutting rates. It's easier to say which banks aren't. Japan, there you go. Uh, which banks aren't going to follow suit Japan. Uh, thus folks, there are love videos on that. Maybe another good one would be notes from the underground. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I read that one a long time ago. The guy whose liver hurts. I think my liver hurts. Um, Swedish Kronos dropped a lot and accelerated when they said they were going to cut, so don't expect any big cuts any time. What? The Swedish krona dropped a lot and accelerated when they said they were going to cut, so don't expect any big cuts anytime soon. Um, the move in the currency has nothing to do with the bank wanting to cut or not. Just because the currency moves doesn't take a cut off the table. I'm not getting that. As a Swede, it's going to be interesting. Housing down 15% <clears throat> already and double amount of properties listed for sale. New building starts at record lows and bankruptcies in all sectors at record highs. Well, those are conditions for rate cuts. In my opinion, Fed will have to go first if we're going to see any large cuts from anyone else. Well, you just listed a whole bunch of conditions for rate cuts. And your central bank basically said they're going to cut in the next... You know, at, in, in the next few meetings, they basically said they're going to cut. We're not, we're not hypothesizing that they're going to cut or forecasting they're going to cut. We're repeating exactly what they said. And the currency being down is nothing, it does not invalidate a cut. And everything you pointed out is an argument for rate cuts. So, is there a reason why you track? Uh, reverse repo transactions uh, with New York Fed instead of uh, a report on the Fed's balance sheet. Fed's balance sheet is till Wednesday uh, with New York Fed. I get it every single day. I get it the Friday. So the Fed's balance sheet is week over week. You get one look uh, every Wednesday, uh, whereas uh, with the New York Fed, you can see the balance every single day. Uh, selling 93 puts, selling 100 calls on TLT. Do you think this short strangle strategy is riskier? No, no, I, 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 I can't see it breaching 100 yet, not until they really start to cut. Uh, and I think 93 is a safe place to be. I mean, even today we're 91 and change. I still think 93 is a good place to be. Um, 
even more convicted today that I would sell 93s, you know, uh, April is a little too soon. April is going to be happening, not enough days to expiration, but certainly May 93s, I would be doing that. Um, you're going to get something um, uh, at the next, uh, at the next um, FOMC meeting on the taper on the balance sheet. That's going to be supportive of longer term yields. Uh, and I think uh, you'll get some indication that probably June will be our first rate cut. Uh, has your short term outlook for copper companies changed since the Chinese smelter development? Not really. I, I think that's still just a short term thing. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there can't be other developments going on <clears throat> in the copper space, and there, there has, but the forecasts are more for, you know, two years from now, three years from now, uh, uh, hitting a wall of, of, of supply, uh, a wall, uh, uh, a demand wall hitting, so, <laughs> let's try that again, demand hitting just a, a, a wall of supply where uh, it, it, I'm saying it wrong again, Demand overwhelming supply. Let's just say that. We'll take the word wall out of there because it's just not working. Where demand will uh, really start to outstrip supply. But that's probably two, two years uh, down the road from where we are now. Um, what is helping Freeport right now is gold. Right? So uh, you have copper miners and the price of copper really is fluctuating between four... Well, I've seen a 398 up to about 407, not time, but 407. Um, and Freeport, uh, you know, when copper did this to 415, came back down, is now doing this. Freeport the whole time has gone, has continued to go straight up. Uh, what gives, whenever you're mining for copper, you're going to get other stuff, gold, silver uh, in the U.S., uh, molybdenum. Uh, well, gold prices have just been doing this. And if you look at Indonesia, where Freeport has a mine in Indonesia, uh, as they're taking copper out of the ground, they get gold. They just come up with gold. Well, they have so much gold that they're coming up with that by the time they sell the gold, the copper has a negative price. In other words, after selling the gold, they're already making money. The copper is just a bonus. Uh, so even if you have a copper price that is going sideways, but a gold price that is going up, uh, Freeport will benefit from that because it means that its copper out of Malaysia is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to mine, and its margins on its copper are widening. Um, so that's, uh, that, that helps explain why Freeport is, is going up. So have a look at whatever copper miner that you're following and have a look at the other materials that it comes up with because you can't just pick and choose. You can't just tell the ore, listen, I only want the copper. Uh, when you pull the ore up, uh, you're going to get all the other minerals that come with it. Uh, and, and they do sell those off. And those do lower the average unit cost of, of their, main, uh, 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 their main product for Freeport. Uh, that is copper. But uh, based on the, uh, on the China smelter um, news i haven't changed my mind that that is a short-term event that that i don't see that as being a long-term event reason is is if copper prices uh, continue to go up and uh, demand starts to outstrip supply that that capacity comes back online really fast it comes back online really fast so it's it's not it's not a trend it's just an event uh if you had to generate income trading options on SPY, what strategy would you use? Uh, I would use very low delta, 10 delta, 8 delta, 5 delta, very low, very, you know, to the point where the ROI would be, you know, disrespectful, uh, which means that I wouldn't do it. <clears throat> but if I had to and I had no choice, I'd be taking a very low ROI. Um, Palantir. Why do you assess PEG equals three? Well, why not? I'm not assessing it by saying, uh, you know, hey, this looks good. I'm saying, you know, if you go all the way up to a PEG equals three, you get to, you get to uh, the current cash adjusted price. That's, you know, it's one way to look at the valuation is that on a forward basis, it's got a PEG of three. Uh, Palantir's a lot of chance of accounting fraud. Hmm, that's a bold claim. I didn't present enough. 
looking at the spread between operating and cash flow from operations. Yeah, so um, non-cash, there's a big non-cash, like $425 million. Uh, this is uh, for stock-based compensation, which is non-cash, but it's still an expense on the income statement. And since it's non-cash, it gets added back uh, in CFO. So if you start from there, you know, they had, what, roughly about $710 million. I'm guessing CFO somewhere around the 700 million mark, and I think they had somewhere around the after-tax 200 million net income. Uh, so if you add this back, you're already at 625, right? Uh, that's the non-cash share-based compensation. I saw the puts on VIX with the 16th October exercise date are priced significantly lower. Well, VIX, you got to keep understand VIX is sentiment based, right? So if you have uh, uh, a contango curve on VIX and you're looking at a put option at a particular strike, as you go past each month, that put is further and further out of money. That means if the delta here is 0.5, the delta here might be 0.4, you might be 0.3, you might be 0.2, all at the same strike price as you go across each month. Well, obviously, it would be cheaper. Um, that's just telling you that you're further and further away, uh, that the delta, I shouldn't say further, uh, that the delta is just getting lower and lower. Look at the deltas, and you'll find that the delta is lower. Market is pricing in much higher volatility on that specific date. It's inconsistent on the term structure. Now, I don't think that you can look at the put price and say that the market is pricing in higher volatility and tie it to the term structure. I think you can only understand this put price in relation to the term structure. Considering a 5% allocation in the copper theme, uh, FCX or COPEX, well, COPEX is more diversified right there. You're more diversified, less company risk. On the ARB trade, I would not bet on the stock price cratering. On the other hand, the coin halving event would theoretically double the coin price. Coin supply cut in half, so price doubles. That's not what halving is. The halving is uh, the miners, whenever they complete a block, used to get 6.5 Bitcoin. Now they're going to get 3.125 Bitcoin. 3.125 Bitcoin, and I think this happens every 220,000 coins. It halves. Uh, in other words, the reward they get for a block gets cut in half, not the supply. The supply stays the same. The supply doesn't get cut in half. And you say if the price doubles, well, the price, you know, the price has doubled. If you look at a chart of Bitcoin, it was sitting around the 35,000. Now it's up at 75,000. There's your 2x. How many more 2x's do you want on the same thing? Uh, if, if you were going to go with the doubling, the market all, will already price that in ahead of time. It, it won't wait until the day and go, oh my God, look what happened. Everybody doubled. Uh, but that's not how having works. The supply does not get cut in half. That is to pan out, just like all previous having events. That's not true. The current price of MicroStrategy is only 15% overvalued. Yeah, but I mean, even if we go on that on that argument, what you're saying is that um, you've got uh, investment one or investment two. Investment one has already doubled, and investment two hasn't doubled yet. That by the time we get to having, if you bought uh, the grayscale uh, uh, ETF, you would then double. Whereas you're saying this is already doubled, so don't count on it following. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Is is what, why would why would you pay any premium at all for micro strategy to hold Bitcoin when you can hold Bitcoin at its net asset value? Why would you pay any premium at all? Because any argument you can make here, you can make here at net asset value, right? So, but a lot of, uh, a lot of flaws in, in the statement here. You mentioned you think a high probability the Fed will cut more than three times. Are you putting more weight to a recession-induced cut or the Fed coming in terms of cutting three times will likely reduce certain inflationary factors such as housing? Um, I think that they're going to find uh, that prices are going to continue to fall faster than what they think. Uh, I mean, if we look at auto sales for Q1 uh, of 2024, uh, you have the average selling price of a vehicle down 
some 3.6% over, over last year. That's deflation. That, that's not that the price has risen three point, only 3.6%. The price has actually dropped 3.6%. Uh, for EVs, the price has dropped even more. Uh, so that is, that is deflation. Why? Because supply is coming up. Uh, you have inventory on dealer lots that are almost at pre-pandemic levels. You have discounts to move cars increasing. You have price drops to move cars increasing. And that's just cars. Uh, but it has a 4% weighting in the CPI. Uh, and if that's happening to new cars, used cars are going to follow suit. You wouldn't pay more for a used than a new car. It's going to follow suit, which means that new car used car prices have probably dropped considerably as well. Used cars are about for another 4%. So there's 8% uh, of the index uh, that, has, that is an outright deflation. Uh, now, we can look at PMIs. The last PMI uh, manufacturing showed prices paid, prices paid increasing a lot more than expected. But these are manufacturers. Uh, this is not the price. This, is, this stuff that they pay for is not in the CPI. It may be in the PPI, but it's not in the CPI. The CPI is what is watched, and the PCE in particular is what is watched. Um, and we're seeing that, yes, during the first quarter, commodity prices did increase, but the average selling price per car is down 3.6%. So what does this tell you about gross margins for auto, for auto companies? What does that tell you about their gross margins? If their input costs are increasing, but their prices are decreasing, gross margins get squeezed. So when I looked at the, P, the PMI prices paid, uh, that's PPI, prices paid, I'm not too concerned because... Uh, that is that is not what the consumer is going to pay, and more and more you're hearing companies saying we have limited ability to raise prices. If you uh, go back and review a bunch of the uh, first quarter uh, uh, earnings releases and conference calls, that is the theme you heard in a lot of companies. We've got limited ability to raise prices at this point, which means if input costs are increasing, they're just going to have margins that are squeezed. So I think that prices are going to come down faster than what the Fed thinks. And I think that the high level of debt is, is a conversation. I mean, how many more people in the last couple of weeks have come out saying the debt's a big problem? You've got some uh, uh, large fund managers that are saying, we can't just turn our head to this. We can't just ignore this. You even have some people uh, uh, from government that were in different administrations coming out now saying something's got to be done. Like you can't continue on uh, uh, this stream. And the CBO last week uh, released its projections, super, super rosy projections, but showed debt increasing to levels in which the, uh, the interest on the debt, just the interest on the debt is going to be about 25% of GDP, 25%. No, sorry, not GDPs. 25% of tax revenue. 25% of tax revenue. 5.6%. Uh, and that's assuming, that's assuming that you're going to get to something like 20% uh, uh, tax as a percent of G GDP, which is a really high level. 17 is usually normal. So you're sitting at 33% to, to, for the Federal Reserve to ignore that is to say that we are going to kill inflation today only to create a huge economic crisis for the next decade. That would be silly. That's one of their mandates. No, they will cut. They will cut more than three. I just think they want to be careful about telling the market they want to cut more than three. But, but I think they all in their heads are realizing that we're near an end game on this debt. If we keep interest rates at these levels for another year, another year, uh, we're, we're crippling the G part of GDP, right? C plus I plus G plus X minus M. We are crippling this part over here uh, and draining the economy of resources because a lot of treasuries are held in other countries. So that interest payment has to leave that country and go to other countries. It's a big leaky bucket and you can't let it continue. It is... You can do it for a period of time, but if you're going to turn over all your debt at this higher interest rate, you're going, you're going to have to crush a lot of people. 
because you got to get that money from somewhere and you can't spend what you want to spend. And if you don't get the money from people and you continue to spend what you spend, the Fed's balance sheet will have to balloon so large there'll be major buyers uh, uh, of this debt. And while if they're major buyers, that's going to drive down, uh, uh, going to drive down long-term yields. So something has to give. The only way out of this uh, is debt reduction uh, and, and a, a massive reduction in, in the speed at which the debt increases, which means 0% interest. you got to get to the zero line as fast as you can. These are big, big problems that no one seems to be wanting to point to, but we can all clearly see with our own eyes this is, this, this is a big deal. And I think that conversations going on behind the scenes around the world are highlighting that, that look at Japan. Look at Japan. Japan had to go to the zero line. Uh, and, and look at the size of their debt now. Uh, now, they went to the zero line for other reasons, but look at the size of their debt, 263% of GDP. Any, any attempt to get off that zero line, the central bank will have to buy all that debt. And there'll be more debt because the interest cost will go up. Uh, and what are you going to do, get it from a shrinking population? No. No, no, no. Uh, the, your way out at this point is to stop the bleeding, which means you got to stop the deficits and you have to stop the, the, the accrual of the interest on all of this stuff, which means you got to get it to zero fast. And I, think, I think behind the scenes you're going to hear more and more about debt until it's the only story on the street is debt. Uh, and... and um, the bond market may react by raising yields to a point where, where everybody now has to pay attention to it. And I do think the end goal is zero, is, is zero, even if the Fed doesn't want to go there. Now the TLTs dip below 92. Do you think it's a good time to buy calls instead of sell? Yeah, yeah, I don't know that I'd be buying $100 calls, but yeah. With this level of debt, do you have any concerns that long duration bonds won't be bought unless interest rates are increased? Not for a reserve currency. So the U.S. is in a nice position. Uh, Canada is not. Uh, it's not a reserve currency, and there's no reason why anybody need hold Canadian bonds. Uh, it is a small country with small trading partners. So uh, as far as foreign banks needing to hold, uh, um, uh, you know, Canadian dollars, it's minimal. It's it's minimal on a portfolio basis, uh, on a global trade portfolio basis. It's minimal. So Canada is in a, a really bad situation. I would look for a Bank of Canada cut at the very next meeting uh, and continued cuts after that. Um, yeah, continued cuts after that because then and the interest rate cuts will be more about the level of the debt and, and, the, and the cost of financing that debt probably more than anything else. Uh, but uh, the U.S. Is, is in a good place. The U.S. will hurt last. Other places will hurt first. And hopefully their hurting will, will uh, motivate the U.S. To start, to start a conversation about solving this ridiculous problem. Um, don't, expect, don't expect Trump to solve it. Uh, that, uh, it doesn't serve his own personal interests. Um, Trump will do what serves his own personal interests, which is extend his tax cuts, maybe even greater tax cuts. Uh, and the debt, be damned, it's not his debt. He doesn't care as long as he's okay. Uh, so uh, Biden, I think, will just continue to social spend. So neither one of them would have solved it, neither one. So the U.S., I don't think, really has a chance of solving this till 2028. If if they're not a dictatorship before 2028, you never know. Trump may decide at some point to set aside the Constitution. Uh, do U.S. Treasuries have less margin requirement? In, and I'd be less margin requirement than what? They have low margin requirement, but less margin requirement than what? I guess would be my question. I have tried to start. Uh, thus spoke Zarathustra at least ten times. Difficult to pull it apart. Uh, it's a very interesting writing style, isn't it? It's, it's not a philosophy book per se written in that style. It's, it's meant to be a novel, uh, a story of this, of this guy who at 30 goes up into the mountain 
which is interesting because at 30, that's when Jesus began his ministry. And that's when usually 30 is the number that you see across a bunch of different religions as, the, as starting their ministries. This guy goes up in the mountain at 30, comes down at 40 uh, with, with this insight uh, and speaks. And, and it's written almost in a biblical sense, almost in a Lutheran sense. Uh, with some kind of, with, you know, and it, in German, it's the translation that's important, right? Like there, I think there's seven different translations out there. Uh, some things don't translate very well, so you got to find the right word in English to get the translation. Um, and and the choice of punctuation really matters as well. Uh, so um, I think there's, yeah, there's seven seven translations out there. Uh, all slightly different and all reading slightly different. Uh, but you have to sort of get the, the cadence <clears throat> and the rhythm of, of what the author or what uh, uh, Nietzsche is, is saying and how he's saying it. What I like to say is you have to break his code first. Once you have the code, <clears throat> once you break the code, it becomes easy to read. Uh, with Canada cutting rates before the yes mean the U.S. dollar would strengthen relative to the Canadian? <clears throat> Most likely, yes. Uh, make a video on how you think differently than the average investor. I don't know that I think differently regarding strategic investment decisions. Yeah, I don't know that I think differently than the average. Well, uh, if we break it out into average retail, average institutional, uh, <clears throat> the average institutional investor thinks differently than the average retail investor. I think more like an institutional investor uh, in, in terms of, you know, how I, how I view certain themes. Um, I don't think like a retail investor. So, you know, it's a little, I guess, I guess that would be the difference, but I don't know that I, that I think much differently than most people that are serious about this. I think many people are comfortable being on the sidelines right now with money markets yielding four to five, but you've indicated you can generate well in excess of that with options. Well, um, that's just having experience and knowing, knowing what can be done, right? So if I were skiing on a mountain, I might avoid the double black diamond runs. And most a and the average skier would avoid the double black diamond runs because they haven't got the skill set to navigate it. But they recognize they don't have the skill set. That's why they don't go there. Uh, but those with the skill set will go there. It's the same thing for the retail trader. Maybe they're on the sidelines because they don't have the skill set uh, to be to be in the market and navigate that market. They're more comfortable being on the side, uh, whereas I have the skill set. Right, so I don't know that <clears throat> that I'm any different in my thinking as much as I'm different in my experience. Uh, if MicroStrategy is so overpriced, how come BlackRock, Vanguard, Morgan Stanley, and other major institutions hold over 65%? They do it through uh, passive investments. So BlackRock has ETFs, and ETFs have a bunch of names in them, period. So when somebody buys ETF shares, uh, the sponsor, you know, well, the authorized participant buys the uh, stock in that proportion, gives it to the ETF company in exchange for shares, and then they sell those ETF shares. So they are bought passively without any consideration for valuation whatsoever. So MicroStrategy is in indexes, and it's in the Russell 2000, for example. And anytime somebody buys the IWM, well, Somebody somewhere has to buy MicroStrategy and hold on to MicroStrategy. So you look at the amount of money in IWM, 1% um, of that is held in MicroStrategy, whether, whether you like it or not. It's just held passively. And the holders would be the sponsors of the ETFs, whether they be BlackRock, Vanguard, Morgan Stanley, or whomever. Um, <clears throat> that is the sort of danger of passive investing is that if you have so much passive investing, uh, nobody anywhere is buying anything based on valuation. They're buying it based on membership of an index, and that's, that's it. Uh, so valuation matters little when it's a, a component of an index. Uh, 
and, and with the height of passive and the amount of money in passive investing, that's why you get you know, some of these companies with ridiculous valuations because there are fewer and fewer people that actually care about its valuation. They only care about its membership. Give your opinion on Chewy. They're uh, trying to remember this online pet food or something like that. Heavily shorted stock has been taking a beating past two years. Fundamentals seem solid, although growth will be slow in the short term, trading at a peg of below one. Uh, well, usually once growth starts to gr starts to go, uh, because of what's called operational leverage, your earnings per share drop by more. Uh, so if you have negative growth of 10% in revenues, you might have, uh, you know, if you have an operational leverage of two, uh, you have a 20% drop in um, operating in operating income, which you know travels right through to the bottom line. And it's also, you know, how much debt do they have uh, as well? You have to look at the whole capital structure because equity is last. Uh, that debt gets what that debt gets no matter what. Do they have a wall of debt coming up? Do they have, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a maturity uh, schedule in 2024 or 2025? The fundamentals may look good uh, until you factor in a debt repayment. And, uh, you know, with shrinking sales, can, is there a belief that they can go back to the market and refinance that debt? Yeah, so you have, to, you have to look at the capital structure. I don't know enough about this company other than I think they, they're an online pet food uh, company. Don't know enough about them to, to know what their capital structure looks like, to know what their debt maturities uh, look like. I don't know anything about that. Uh, but if you see something... You know, peg ratio less than one. I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at it and say, well, that's really good. <clears throat> I would, I would start asking, well, why is that? What am I missing? There must be some piece of the puzzle I'm missing uh, that that puts it that way. Anyways, um, that's it.